Turner Home Entertainment presents a dialogue, a conversation with Carl Sagan and Ted Turner. Carl Sagan is one of the greatest minds on this planet. He's an accomplished scientist who has played a leading role in the Mariner, Viking, and Voyager expeditions to other planets. His research has enhanced our understanding of numerous aspects of the heavens. And he's brought his work to a general audience through such books as the Pulitzer Prize winning Dragons of Eden and his Emmy and Peabody award winning series on television Cosmos. In addition, he has taken a strong stand in defense of this planet and its people by working with his colleagues on research into the long term effects of nuclear war and the destruction of our environment. And he's made us aware of the tremendous dangers facing us if we don't do something to halt the arms race. I'm grateful that he's here to share some of his knowledge with us. Carl, pleasure to have you here this evening. Here, Ted, thank you. We're destroying the ozone layer. We're heating up the earth. We're destroying our forests. We're poisoning the groundwater with radioactive wastes and pesticides. How do we ever get in this mess, and is there any way out? <laughs> well, <laughs> How's that a, for a start? That's a, that's a good question. Well, we got into the mess by, uh, by not paying attention and by business as usual. Uh, humans have been on this planet for something like a million years. And for the vast bulk of that time, things change extremely slowly. The population increased very slowly. Our technology increased, improved, but by very slow steps. And just recently, you know, this is what's called an exponential. It's flat for a long time, and then, boom, you suddenly get a huge increase. Increase in population, increase in technology, increase in pollution, increase in our powers to disturb the environment, to change the planetary environment. But we're the same old human beings uh, as, as we were a thousand years ago and a hundred thousand years ago. Um, not much has changed with us. And so it's very hard for us to catch on that, uh, that there's a new situation and we have to adapt to it. On the other hand, that's one thing we humans are good at, uh, adapting, figuring out. Uh, um, we're smart. That's our principal advantage over all the other species. I mean, we're not faster, stronger, better diggers. We don't fly all by ourselves. Uh, what we do is figure out and build because of our, our hands. And so uh, I think there's uh, certainly a chance of getting out of this mess, but not by business as usual, not by the idea that, uh, that we shouldn't plan ahead, not by the idea that anybody can do whatever the hell they want and... Uh, it doesn't uh, affect the environment. There has to be a new way of looking at the world. A lot of those uh, uh, issues that you, that you raised are global issues. For example, uh, global warming, the greenhouse effect. Uh, you put gases like carbon dioxide or CFCs, other greenhouse gases, into the atmosphere over this country. They don't stay over that country. The, those molecules don't have passports. They don't know about national sovereignty. That's something they never heard of. The atmospheric circulation spreads those gases all over the planet. And so what one country does affects all the other countries. The solution to these kinds of problems has to be that everybody on Earth works together. The industrialized nations have the biggest responsibility because they're the biggest polluters. The United States puts more CO2 in the atmosphere than any other nation. But uh, Western Europe and the Soviet Union and Japan and even the developing countries all make significant contributions. So there has to be a new way of looking at the future, and that is that we're all humans, members of the same species, on one fragile little planet. We're all in this together, and we have to work together. Uh, that's kind of the silver lining of these crises. They are forcing us to become a planetary species. Well, that's, uh, that's interesting, and, and, and I certainly, certainly agree with that. I know another problem that uh, that we're certainly all all aware of is the is the bloated uh, arsenals of uh, of nuclear nuclear weapons. Uh, we've had a tremendous uh, thawing in relations between the the two superpowers. We have a uh, the, the Soviets are going to be meeting with the Chinese. We have a seem to have a, a real move away from uh, war here on the planet and a, a move towards uh, towards peace. Do you, do you think we can get rid of these nuclear arsenals, and, and how do we go about doing it? Well, you've got to ask what they're for. I mean, presumably, neither the United States nor the Soviet Union really intends to, uh, to blow up the planet, to uh, you know, destroy the global civilization. That's not what they're about. The uh, professed function of the nuclear weapons on each side is to prevent 
the other side from using their nuclear weapons. If that's all it is, then we've got to ask, how many nuclear weapons do you need to do that? Uh, so, uh, for example, you could ask, how many cities are there on the planet Earth? Let's say a city has 100,000 people or more. You probably don't need more weapons than what's required to destroy every city on Earth. There's only 2,300 cities. So the United States, by that criterion, only needs 2,300 nuclear weapons. Well, we got more than 25,000, more than 10 times enough to destroy every city. But not all those cities are our enemies either. No, no, well, I mean, including but, our own cities. But the Soviets say they're not our enemies either. I mean, I don't, I don't know who, who has enemies so bad that they, they're, they're willing to even think about dropping nuclear weapons on them. That's right. And and you've got to really hate somebody to do that. Well, and it's suicidal. <laughs> I mean, it's stupid even if you hate somebody. If they have nuclear weapons and you attack them, they're going to attack you. And, uh, and so the thing is immensely stupid. If we were only concerned about deterrence, that's the magic word, to deter the other side from using their nuclear weapons, then all you need is a tiny fraction of the present bloated, grotesque, and ruinous, uh, including ruinous in cost, uh, arsenals. Uh, a minimum deterrence that is absolutely safe, that is an invulnerable retaliatory capability, could be done for a thousand nuclear weapons or a few hundred nuclear weapons. So, you see, what's happened recently is there's been this much ballyhooed uh, INF uh, treaty, uh, Intermediate uh, Range Nuclear Forces, which uh, is terrific. I'm all for it. It lowers the arsenals by about 3%, and the nuclear warheads are being recycled. They're not even being gotten rid of. What we have to do is make vast, massive cuts in the arsenals on both sides. And nothing short of that is going to make us safe. Well, do you, how, do, do you think that, uh, that, that, that there's the political will uh, here in the United States? The Soviets, they tell me, I'm sure they've told you, they're willing to uh, get rid of them, get rid of them uh, on a, over a reasonable uh, time frame because we don't uh, see any confrontations anymore. Do you think that uh, this administration has the political will to, uh, to join in with that? Hard to tell. I mean... It, certainly the new factor, the stunning change in the world situation, is the accession of Mikhail Gorbachev to, uh, to power in the Soviet Union. So it's not just that they're willing to have uh, an INF agreement with, uh, with intrusive inspection, American inspectors on Soviet soil, uh, but they're willing to have much more than that. They've made, they made unilateral cuts in their um, conventional forces. For a year and a half, they made a unilateral uh, moratorium on nuclear weapons testing. testing, inviting the United States to, to respond, to join, to reciprocate. And so far, nothing. Carl, it's been a long time uh, since I've uh, gotten updated or we've been updated on uh, the status of, of the theory of nuclear winter. Could you, could, could you bring us up to date on that? Well, nuclear winter is the predicted, uh, from, from physics calculations, uh, cooling and darkening of the earth following a nuclear war. Basically what happens is uh, mainly from the burning of cities, fine particles get uh, put up into the atmosphere, block sunlight, and uh, so it gets darker and, and cooler. Uh, we uh, did, uh, a little more than five years ago, a set of calculations showing that the effect was horrendous even for a small nuclear war, that the burning of a hundred downtowns uh, globally was enough to produce a hemispheric-wide global uh, nuclear winter. And uh, there have been uh, a lot of debates on it because it has a set of very uh, disturbing uh, implications about the nuclear arms race. It challenges the fundamental ideas of, uh, of nuclear deterrence. Uh, and there's been a lot of fighting. What's happened now is that there's been a very nice convergence. Uh, some of the... Uh, the prior claims that uh, it's only a nuclear autumn, it's not so bad, it's, it's not as bad as a nuclear winter, turn out to have occurred from uh, n everybody not putting the, the same smoke at the same altitudes. When everybody starts with the same starting conditions, you end up with the same very serious effects. So now that there's a convergence in the science, it's important to uh, understand what the policy implications are. One policy implication, it comes back to your question a minute ago about uh, how many nuclear weapons is enough, uh, is uh, the idea that if nation A makes a massive attack for whatever reason on nation B, 
Nation B doesn't do anything to defend itself or to retaliate. Nevertheless, the smoke that gets raised over Nation B circulates around the world, covers Nation A. Nation A gets cold and dark and the agriculture fails. And uh, Nation A has destroyed itself by launching a nuclear war on Nation B. The main consequence of, uh, of nuclear winter is uh, massive agricultural failures. And uh, many international uh, study groups have now concluded that the, uh, the net result in mass starvation can account for many billions of lives. Well, there's only five billion. How many is many? Well, hard to quantify, but you're absolutely right. It's a big fraction of the human community, and that's the long-term effect and the prompt effects. You know, you're going to kill many hundreds of millions, maybe one or two billion people in the direct consequence of a nuclear war. So it now appears that uh, that nuclear war certainly will destroy the, the nations involved with the nuclear war, almost certainly will destroy the global civilization, and might just possibly destroy the human species. So it's another uh, calibration of how serious the stakes are these days, how high the stakes are, because of our technology. Nuclear war has put us in a position to do utter devastation to our species. Putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere promises, if that's the right word, uh, a global catastrophe, not just uh, destruction of, uh, of farmland, uh, flooding, some places drought, other places rise in sea level, inundation of coastal cities all over the planet. That's serious stuff. The depletion of the ozone layer uh, from uh, these chlorofluorocarbon compounds lets more ultraviolet light from the sun down to the surface of the earth. Skin cancer is a serious consequence. That's the one we hear mostly about, especially us light-skinned people. Uh, Dark-skinned people are much better protected against it. But the more serious aspect of it is that the ultraviolet light attacks the, the little one-celled plants that are at the base of the food chain. You know, those are the guys that the next guys eat, and the next guys, the next guys. And the way up at the top of that ecological pyramid, there's us. And we're ultimately eating the one-celled plants that have been processed through lots of intermediate uh, plants and animals. And uh, so, again, we're messing around with uh, the global environment in a very serious, very stupid way. And uh, we just have to get our technology in hand. It's not enough to say that, uh, that uh, corporations can do whatever they want as long as they make a profit, not if they're putting at risk people all over the world. They can't. There has to be a new way of approaching this. And we can't say that one nation can do what it wants within its borders. Because as I said before, what you do in one country's borders has consequences all over the planet. Well, we're going to talk, be talking about space exploration, too, and uh, not just all gloom and doom. But while we're on the subject, <laughs> what can the average person... I mean, that, I think a lot of average people have heard a lot about this as the environmental and nuclear threat have been pounded in and pounded in, and we're at CNN continue to uh, raise the, the alarm cry. But what can the average, uh, what can the average citizen do about it? Uh, because that's really... A sense of hopelessness is not something that uh, you want to convey or that I want to convey. What can the average citizen do to affect changes on the part of, uh, of our government to, 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 to make the moves that are necessary? See, I, I don't think it's hopeless uh, at all. As I said before, uh, humans are good at figuring stuff out, and we're good at change. We've had a lot of changes. What in can the America. viewers of this program do to make a difference in correcting these problems? They can make sure that candidates who don't understand and aren't deeply committed to ending and reversing the nuclear arms race, to stopping greenhouse warming, and to uh, stopping the depletion of the ozonosphere, that those guys aren't, men and women, are not elected. It's not enough to have a candidate say, I'm an environmentalist. In what way are you an environmentalist, Mr. or Ms. Candidate? Take a look at the, the most recent election. Uh, there we had a candidate who uh, said that he was an environmentalist. He, in contrast, to the previous eight years, where we had an uncompromising anti-environmentalist in the White House. Okay, now there's a president, Mr. Bush, who at least acknowledges that there's a problem. We didn't even know that from, from listening to Mr. Reagan. But if you look at Mr. Bush's budget, we see not a hint of any real commitment to the environment. So I, th I say, in a democracy, that's, that's the most important thing a person can do. There are a lot of other things a person can do. You can plant trees. 
every individual can plant trees. That's something that's very constructive. You can boycott industries which are irresponsible on global warming and on chlorofluorocarbons. There are many things people can do, but they have to understand the issue before they can do those things. Well, we just had an election. We won't have another one for a couple of years. Uh, do you do you have uh, any faith in, in writing letters to your congressmen and, and senators? A lot of people believe that that has some effect. Uh, I think that it can have some effect. Uh, there's a multiplier effect because so few people do write. Those who do, the right. congressional staff says, hey, there must be 10 or 100 times as many people who agree with this letter but who haven't written to us. So that's, that's important, but, uh, but that's not nearly enough. People have to inform themselves. They have to understand these issues, and this then relates to the whole problem of, uh, of Americans not understanding science, not understanding mathematics, not being able to read, not know geography. I mean, we're in very bad trouble if we don't understand the planet we're trying to save. Carl, you've been uh, involved with the space program for the last 30 years in a very major way. What do you think of the greatest benefits that have uh, accrued from our expenditures and our exploration of space? There's a huge number of them. Um, one is uh, satellite communications. I mean, the, this conversation is uh, being broadcast uh, all, over all over the world, largely via communication satellites. They sit up there, they go around the Earth as fast as the Earth rotates, so they hover over one spot, and so you can send a message to one of them, and back it comes down to a different part of the Earth, and it binds the Earth together. It's a very powerful political fact that there's a different way from what we were talking about before, in which technology is binding the Earth together. Another uh, aspect that I think is tremendously important is those photographs of the Earth alone in space, fragile, blue world, in this vast blackness, this vacuum, velvety vacuum of space. And it's, it's clear, it's very thin atmosphere. It's so sensitive to the depredations of human beings. You look at that and you say, hey, that's only one little world. We don't have anywhere else to go. No other planet in the solar system is a suitable home for human beings. It's this world or nothing. That's a very powerful perception. Uh, then, in, in the particular field that, I, uh, that I'm involved with, uh, the exploration of planets, by, usually by robotic spacecraft, uh, there we have opened up a, a universe of wonders. We have looked close up at uh, dozens of new worlds, worlds that we never saw before. And uh, unless we're so stupid as to destroy ourselves, there are going to be people exploring those worlds. There are going to be human habitations on those worlds. We're going to be moving out into space in the next century. Uh, and uh, I'm fortunate enough to have played a role in the first preliminary reconnaissance of the solar system. That's a terrifically exciting thing. Then there's the fact that uh, when you study these other worlds, you learn about this one. It's a very important fact. If you look at uh, the individuals who played key roles in uh, discovering the uh, threat to the ozone layer, the increasing greenhouse effect, nuclear winter, you find a very high uh, preponderance of planetary scientists uh, working in there. People have cut their teeth on other worlds and then come back to examine this one. By comparing our world with other worlds, you can see a lot of things that can go wrong. Venus, for example, has this immense greenhouse effect. Surface temperature is hot enough to melt uh, tin or lead. Anybody who says the greenhouse effect is, uh, is just some fantasy, all they have to do is look at Venus, a very important object lesson. And then there's one more, there are a lot more, but there's one more in particular uh, kind of uh, advantage of space exploration that uh, I would stress, and, uh, or of, of space technology. And that is military reconnaissance and treaty verification satellites. If you don't know what the other side is doing, then the standard uh, military prudence is to assume the worst, the worst case. That means you then build up your armaments for the worst that they possibly could do. They see that you're doing some of that, they do the same, and you have a nuclear arms race which is absolutely catastrophic with our present technology. The satellites tell you what's actually happening there to remarkably high fidelity. So it calms the hotheads and paranoids on both sides. And that's worth its weight in gold. So put all that together. Plus weather satellites, uh, they save billions of dollars in, uh, in crops every year just from knowing what, what bad weather is happening so farmers can take precautions. Um, 
the space program has paid for itself many times over, and uh, none of this, of course, has to do with putting people up into space. There may be good reasons for doing that, historical reasons, uh, social reasons, reasons for building bridges with other countries. I'm, for example, a strong advocate for uh, a long-term joint U.S.-Soviet program to put Americans and Russians on Mars. Uh, I think that would be wonderful for for uh, joining the two countries together in a grand common endeavor on behalf of the human species, benign, high technology, reaching out to the next century. Um, uh, and there are many other still unrealized practical applications of uh, the space program. We've not given it nearly the attention it deserves, and especially in the last 10 or 15 years, the United States uh, has been awful. Since 1978, the U.S., which led pioneered the exploration of the solar system, has not launched one spacecraft to the moon or planets. In more than a decade, we have not launched one. We hope that there will be uh, shortly, later, later this year, uh, the end of that, of that drought. But uh, we have let the space program uh, languish in the last 10 or 15 years, as we have let all sorts of social programs languish, as we have permitted uh, uh, the amount of poverty in children to increase. Before the end of this century, more than half the kids in America may be below the poverty line. What kind of a future do we build for the country if we raise all these kids as disadvantaged, as unable to cope with the society, as resentful for the injustice served up to them? This is stupid. And then what happened with the resources is they, they went into increasing uh, budgets for arms. Isn't that uh, where, the, where, the money, where the money went? That and making rich people richer. Those are the two places. Well, the thing about money. rich people, and being one, I guess, <laughs> uh, is, is the money all gets reinvested. If you've got money, you put it in a bank. The bank lends it out to uh, people to buy homes or cars but, or but whatever. But not poor gets, people. But not poor people. Well, that's a good it point. It tends to stay up at that highly stratified, very... More people get employed with capital uh, formation and so forth. Are you a socialist? Uh, I'm not sure what a socialist is, well, but, I I believe that the, but I believe that the government has a responsibility to care for the people. I'm not talking about dole. I'm talking about making people self-reliant, people able to take care of themselves. There are countries which are perfectly able to do that. The United States is an extremely rich country. It's perfectly able to do that. It chooses not to. It chooses to have homeless people. It chooses... It's, we are 19th in the world in infant mortality. 18 other countries save the lives of their babies better than we. How come? They just spend more money on it. They care about their babies more than we care about ours. I think it's a disgrace. And uh, this country has vast... Wealth. You just look at what something like uh, Star Wars, the money spent on Star Wars, already spent $20 billion on it. If these guys are permitted to go ahead, they will spend a trillion dollars on Star Wars. Think of what that money could be used for to educate, to help, to bring people up to a sense of, of uh, self-confidence, to improve not just the happiness of people in America, but their economic standing, to improve the competitiveness of the United States compared to other countries. We are using money for the wrong stuff. Carl, do you think time travel is possible? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, first of all, we all are time travelers. I mean, we travel into the future one year at a time. <laughs> it takes a year to do it. Um, uh, according to uh, Einstein's special relativity, which is uh, a description of the way the world works, I mean, it's, it's true. Uh, you can travel as far into the future as you want uh, if only you travel close enough to the speed of light. You can't travel at the speed of light. You can't travel faster than the speed of light. But there's nothing in physics that prevents you from traveling at, you know, 0.999%, uh, 0 .999 the speed of light. Uh, and then time for you slows down. And so you could travel a million years into the future. And, uh, and be perfectly okay. The question is, could you ever get back? And there is the, is the present debate. Can you go backwards in time? Is it permitted by physics? Never mind, do we have the technology? Obviously, we don't have the technology. An interesting thing has happened uh, lately. I, uh, I, I wrote a few years ago a novel called uh, Contact. Mm -hmm. And uh, in it, I tried to, uh, to imagine a uh, physically reasonable way to go quickly to some, some distant place uh, without traveling close to the speed of light. And I asked a 
friend of mine, Kip Thorne, who's a uh, specialist in gravitation theory at uh, Caltech, to uh, tell me the best way to do it. And that got him working with uh, some of his students. And so they uh, developed a uh, most interesting theory of wormholes, so-called uh, sort of quick paths through space-time. Uh, that seem to be permitted by the laws of physics, although it would require a very high advanced technology, much more advanced than us, to do it. A part of that is that uh, time travel seems to be feasible. And uh, so it is barely conceivable that a very advanced civilization might be able to travel both into their far future and into their past. Uh, it raises all kinds of funny causality problems. What happens if you go back in time kill your grandparents before they gave birth to your parents, then are you alive or dead? What does it mean? Uh, these, are, these are called causality problems, and uh, they are very puzzling. So I would not say we understand this issue, but there's been some most interesting uh, uh, progress recently because of the work of, uh, of Kip Thorne. Well, you know, that really does raise some interesting possibilities, because if the world is going to be environmentally degraded, uh, you could take a a few friends of yours and we could go back uh, in the past and try and see if we couldn't live with the Indians a couple hundred years ago before the white man came. The trouble is that to Indians be able to do that, us. you need such an advanced technology that with that technology you could solve our problems, <laughs> or, or at least solve us. You may be more the problem than the technology. We also got to be the solution, too. Well, let me ask you this question, because you saw, I mean, we're covering so much ground in, in a relatively short period of time. You're an educator, too, and uh, there's so much criticism of the American educational system today. Is that criticism valid, and what can we do to improve our educational system? What needs to be done? Uh, it is valid. And you, if you compare how American kids do compared to kids of the same age in, in other countries, and they do miserably. And I'm not talking ju just about kids in uh, Japan or uh, Germany or the Soviet Union. Kids in uh, Singapore, kids in Thailand do much better in uh, science and technology and mathematics than Americans of the same age. Our kids are not working hard enough. There is not an ethos of respect and admiration for, for learning, certainly not on television. CNN aside, the amount of real intellectual content that appears on the mass media is very little. Uh, the amount of time kids work, the amount of homework, the, s the, the salaries of teachers, the, uh, the encouragement of really good teachers, all of that is in a desperately bad, bad situation. I, I saw a, uh, a study where uh, high school kids in uh, Texas were, were shown a uh, you know, Mercator projection map of the world, but with none of the nations with their names in them. A lot of those kids didn't know where their own country was, could not pick out the United States on a world map. Uh, some ridiculous number than 25% or something, when asked where the Soviet Union was, pointed to Central America. What do we do about it? How can we improve our educational system? But One thing you can do is you can put a lot more federal money towards improving the education uh, in the schools, which is, of course, a, a state function as, as specified in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't say that the federal government can't help to educate its own, its own children so that the United States will, will be in reasonable shape in the future. don't spend more money than any other country on education not, by far? No, I don't think so. Not per capita. I don't think that's right. And the ethic of hard work, the ethic okay. of... Now, that money, money, that, that, I just, I really Teacher's question whether salary. it's a total money problem. Uh, Ted, I, I, know, I know many cases of very bright uh, men and women who are coming out of college who temperamentally would like to be teachers, but the amount of money being offered by industry is so much larger than the amount of money that's uh, offered as a teacher that for financial reasons they go off uh, in, that, uh, in that direction. Do you think it can, it, that problem could completely be solved with money? Uh, I, money alone won't do it at all, because not at all. It requires a change in how attitudes. seriously... And parents say, have to parents, stress. Parents, Less watching teachers, of television, for school, instance. And yeah, oh, ooh, very important for you to say that. Well, I mean, I say it all the time. <laughs> Uh, school boards and mass media. I'll give you an example. More emphasis at every, every level every on newspaper. improving education. Absolutely. Every newspaper in America, with very few exceptions, has a daily astrology column. Astrology is bunk. Astrology is fraud. How many of them have even a weekly science column? Why that disproportion? 
How much real science is there? Well, they say they're giving them, that's what the networks all say. We're just giving the American people what they want. Right. And that, you know, that, and we're that's dragging it. ourselves down and down and that's down it. over the last that's 40 it. years. I, I know, I mean, I've seen it. Carl, I don't think there's anybody on this planet that has better credentials to answer this next question than you do. Do you think that there's uh, life anywhere else in the universe? Well, think, <laughs> think is a strong word. Um, if, if you look at how many other worlds there are, uh, how many stars in the Milky Way galaxy, how likely it is that most of them now, likely now, most of them have planets, how many other galaxies there are, it seems the height of human arrogance to imagine that this planet is the only inhabited world. But at the same time, we don't know if life elsewhere yet. We're just at the very earliest stages of, uh, of exploration, and we've not found life anywhere else. Uh, we've sent uh, spacecraft, uh, as I said before, to, uh, to a wonderful, exquisite array of other worlds. We've learned an enormous amount from them. We find on some of them the, the chemicals necessary for the origin of life, you know, the stirrings, the intimations of life, but no sign of life. We've also used big radio telescopes to see if anybody is sending us a radio message. And both of those efforts have not yet succeeded. So we haven't found life elsewhere. Uh, I, would, I would think a universe in which we are the only living things is much more incredible than a universe just burgeoning, overflowing with life. But we can't be sure. It's an experimental question. It has to be addressed experimentally. And uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, I'm such an advocate for sending spacecraft to other worlds and for using large radio telescopes to, uh, to listen for signals. Are we continuing to listen to those uh, signals and monitoring more frequencies all the time to... Uh... Yeah. The, the, uh, the interesting thing about it is how cheap it is. At the present time, the, uh, by far, most sophisticated uh, radio search program, SETI, it's called Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, program on the planet, is being sponsored and paid for by a private membership organization from members' contributions. It's called the Planetary Society. It's a Pasadena, right, California yeah. organization. I happen to be the president of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's so cheap that, uh, that we're able to do this uh, 8 million channel search, 8 million separate frequency stations, if you like, uh, scanning the northern skies to see if, uh, if anything's coming our way. Nothing's coming our way, our way yet. Uh, th this issue seems to me to be a very fundamental question uh, because we are uh, parochial, we're provincial, we're stuck on one planet, we know only one kind of life, and, uh, and so we don't know what else is possible. Also, if we talk about intelligent beings, uh, we think a certain way. We, we think we've got a lot of stuff figured out. But we're not uh, positive that someone else, smarter than us, independently evolved on a planet of another star might not look at the world in a different way. It would be a very sobering experience for us to compare what we think we know with what other guys smarter than us know. That's one, one of the many important aspects uh, to it. But imagine the other way. Um, I mean, we've now, uh, uh, as I keep saying, made a preliminary reconnaissance of most of the worlds in the solar system. No sign of life. That suggests life doesn't come everywhere. Life isn't all that easy to arise. And it says something, therefore, about the rarity and preciousness of life on our planet. It's something that needs to be cherished, take, taken care of. So the flip side of not finding life elsewhere is a much greater respect for the life that's here. And here, here we are destroying an acre of forest every second on the planet, destroying species left and right, and imperiling even ourselves. It's, I think, a useful perspective to recognize that life isn't all that easy to come by, that we have an obligation to uh, preserve life on this planet. So there are many aspects of looking for life elsewhere that uh, seem to be very important. Another one is our own origins. How did we, us humans, us animals, us life on Earth, how did we get here? Where, how did it come? Well, what do you think? Do you think that there was a, the conventional uh, concept of God, or do you think it just happened? Well, that's not the full range of possibilities. No, that's true. <laughs> we could have come here from somewhere else. Oh, that, that's also possible. But, 
But, uh, well, but then, what, where did we come from before that? Well, absolutely. So you want to watch out for the infinite regress. That, well, that's what's your personal opinion? You know, put you on I'm, the spot I'm, a little I'm bit. I'm a scientist. So I say I go where the evidence goes, mm -hmm. not what I personally I would well, like what to What is the evidence I, as you interpret it? I would love to believe. Your theory. I would love to believe that there was a God who made us, who's looking out for us. And loves us. Loves us. We takes need love. Takes care of us. And... Make because we're because guides us and because keeps we're in us such a mess. We're doing things so wrong. Then we would be relieved of the responsibility of taking care of ourselves. The voice would come from up above and, and say, say, "Don't pollute the atmosphere. Polluting, stop the chlorofluorocarbons." Right. That's right. But that does not seem to be the case. We have to solve our own problems. We have to solve our own problems. Now, on the question of the origin of life, uh, there's been some very interesting progress made uh, on the early Earth. There are two different ways in which the stuff of life, the, the molecules that lead to life, are made. One, it seems very clear, it was made in the primitive atmosphere, lightning, ultraviolet light falling on the earth, that kind of stuff. And the other way is, it fell from the skies. Because at the time of the origin of the earth, comets, a lot of debris was being swept up. The, the solar system was a lot, uh, a lot more traffic in it than there is now. And a lot of that debris, we know from the uh, exploration of Halley's Comet, for example, Comets are very rich in organic matter. So the stuff of life was falling on the earth. Now, is that the hand of God or not? Well, if you believe in God, God established the, the physical laws of the universe. And chemistry is a consequence of physics. So all those molecules that led to life were made by, by God. It's possible to believe that. I, I'm not opposed to that idea. But I just say there is no evidence for it. And where there's no evidence, I say keep an open mind. Don't commit yourself in the absence of compelling evidence. Well, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with you. That we're going to have to solve these problems uh, ourselves uh, that, we, that we have today. And, and, and in historical religions, uh, there are many wonderful, fine teachings, but none of them, uh, they're all ancient uh, by today's standard pre-industrial revolution. And uh, they didn't deal with the, the problems that we had today because when Christ and Muhammad and the, and the other prophets uh, were alive, they didn't have nuclear weapons. There was no problem with overpopulation or environmental problems, so they weren't even mentioned in the commandments and the Koran and, uh, and so forth. Yep. Carl, do we have uh, reason to be hopeful about the future, and what can we do to, to have a hopeful future? Well, I think there's a broad range of, of things that the average person uh, can do, especially in a democracy where, you know, at least in principle, the people control what the government does. Uh, government's supposed to be working for the people, not the other way around. Also on a planet where things are moving very much more towards the idea that the people are, are in control. The Soviet Union, fantastic changes are happening there. Not, not yet all the way. There's not a multi-party system. There's a lot of, a lot of things that that they don't have, but the amount of progress there is absolutely enormous. Those are some signs of, of, of hope. Now, we talked before about, uh, about writing to members of Congress and, uh, and visiting members of Congress, mm -hmm. writing letters to newspapers, uh, uh, television stations when they do a program that seems right. All of that is a useful application of the citizens' democratic uh, prerogatives and has some leverage. It doesn't have a huge amount of leverage in my my personal opinion, because uh, there are a lot of other factors. Uh, uh, there's a concentration of uh, control of the news media in the hands of the wealthy. The wealthy have a particular perspective. Yeah, I haven't seen any poor people owning newspapers or television networks lately. Well, uh, uh, you know, that's a good point, and, and also it doesn't always happen. I mean, I, Besides, if they did own them, they wouldn't be poor for very long. <laughs> yes. Um, so so that's, that's one, one worry. Another worry is that uh, that great wealth has a lot of leverage in a lot of different ways. And so uh, uh, rich people have a lot more control over what gets talked about, what gets seen, which opinions are acceptable and permissible than do poor people. Uh, so just writing letters to, to newspapers or to members of Congress isn't going to do a whole lot. Voting does a whole lot more. Because the one thing that members of Congress and uh, members of the executive branch, I mean, elected members of the executive branch, president and vice president, are very interested in is getting reelected. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it were possible for people to clear away the electoral smokescreen, the stuff that's, that's intended to cloud your mind, the stuff that's intended to, uh, to uh, make you look at, uh, 
at subsidiary issues and not the fundamental issues. Uh, if people can do that, if they can learn to think straight, uh, then they have an enormous uh, leverage, an enormous amount of control. So, I mean, in the previous administration, we, uh, we had a president that thought it was, it was good enough to label a, uh, a very destabilizing, fundamentally first-strike weapon, the MX, as peacekeeper. And as long as we called it peacekeeper, <laughs> then, then <laughs> the eyes close and everybody will be for it by naming it. Uh, we, uh, we had an administration in which a transparent hoax, the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, Star Wars, intended, so we were told, to protect the civilian population, got enormous support. Because the argument was, uh, listen, uh, do you realize that we have no defense against the no, Soviet know, the shield, the commercial That's with right. a little don't you, shield. Don't you want some children? protection? Of course. And of course people, people went for that because the right questions weren't asked. And television, by the way, was full of, uh, of uh, graphics showing uh, right. four Soviet warheads in a spiffy U.S. battle station going zip, 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 zip. And the like an electronic went, game, you exactly, know, at the airport. Exactly. And the warheads went away, and that's what we were going to do until <laughs> so we could protect the United States. It was not the asking of hard questions. So the, the next step, and this is something Thomas Jefferson repeatedly stressed, is that if you want to exercise your democratic privileges and powers, you have to understand the situation, and you have to understand it in a fairly deep way. You have to get beyond the rhetoric that politicians necessarily spread in order to calm everybody and, uh, and to get reelected. So a, an educated populace is absolutely essential. What people can do is to learn the actual facts, to make sure that both sides of the issues are expressed and that they... Uh, there's nothing, by the way, in these issues that the average person can't understand. The average person is plenty smart enough to understand these issues, and most of those cases, almost all of them, which the government said, if you have the facts we have, then you'd reach a different conclusion. That turns out to be bunk. Beyond that, there are a lot of other things people can do. They can demonstrate. They can make mass rallies. There is an American tradition of civil, nonviolent civil disobedience. It worked, well, too. It, it certainly worked. For it helped for do away with, uh, with segregation, and it helped do away with the Vietnam War. That's right. And uh, it seems to me that is very American. We ought to be marching for the environment. We have and marching absolutely. and continue to those courageous souls that have marched against nuclear testing and uh, against SDI. Absolutely. And absolutely. So, for example... We've got to take our future into our own hands. Absolutely agree. Now, let me say another couple of words on... Uh, oh, let me say one thing. Uh, for example, this next uh, April, I think, there's going to be uh, uh, massive demonstrations at the Nevada nuclear test site, right. in which uh, my wife, Andrianne, and I have gone there, been arrested before in nonviolent civil disobedience mm -hmm. because there the Soviets had stopped testing. They say, you guys stop testing, and we dismissed it. We refused to do it for a year and a half. They gave us, to, and they said, you stop testing, we'll stop testing. Testing is the main driver that drives the nuclear arms race. If you can't blow up nuclear weapons, you can't make the next generation of weapons. Uh, I'm in favor of the next generation of people. <laughs> now, I want to say there is a historical perspective which suggests as bad as our problems are, the nuclear arms race, the uh, environmental issues, as bad as all that is, there is some reason for hope. There was once slavery on the planet. It is largely gone. There was once human sacrifice. There was once the divine right of kings. There was lots of stuff that today the we consider... Oppression of women. Absolutely. I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't say that. All of that is changing. And we can change these issues, too, because our lives depend on it. We're smart enough, we're dedicated enough to do it, but not by sitting on our duffs. We have to really work. Take action. Take okay, action. well, Carl, we're out of time. It was a real pleasure to have you here. Same here. Turner Home Entertainment presents A Dialogue, a conversation with Carl Sagan and Ted Turner. Carl Sagan is one of the greatest minds on this planet. 
He's an accomplished scientist who has played a leading role in the Mariner, Viking, and Voyager expeditions to other planets. His research has enhanced our understanding of numerous aspects of the heavens. And he's brought his work to a general audience through such books as the Pulitzer Prize winning Dragons of Eden and his Emmy and Peabody award winning series on television Cosmos. In addition, he has taken a strong stand in defense of this planet and its people by working with his colleagues on research into the long-term effects of nuclear war and the destruction of our environment. And he's made us aware of the tremendous dangers facing us if we don't do something to halt the arms race. I'm grateful that he's here to share some of his knowledge with us. Carl, pleasure to have you here this evening. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. We're destroying the ozone layer. We're heating up the earth. We're destroying our forests. We're poisoning the groundwater with radioactive wastes and pesticides. How do we ever get in this mess, and is there any way out? <laughs> well, <laughs> How's that a, for a start? That's a, that's a good question. Well, we got into the mess by, uh, by not paying attention and by business as usual. Uh, humans have been on this planet for something like a million years, and for the vast bulk of that time, things change extremely slowly. The population increased very slowly. The problem has to be that everybody on Earth works together. The industrialized nations have the biggest responsibility because they're, they're the biggest polluters. The United States puts more CO2 in the atmosphere than any other nation. But uh, Western Europe and the Soviet Union and Japan and even the developing countries all make significant contributions. So there has to be a new way of looking at the future, and that is that we're all humans, members of the same species, on one fragile little planet. We're all in this together, and we have to work together. Uh, that's kind of the silver lining of these crises. They are forcing us to become a planetary species. Well, that's, uh, that's interesting, and, and, and I certainly, certainly agree with that. I know another problem that, uh, that we're certainly all, all aware of is the, is the bloated uh, arsenals of, uh, of nuclear, nuclear weapons. Uh, we've had a tremendous uh, thawing in relations between the, the two superpowers. We have a uh, the, the Soviets are going to be meeting with the Chinese. We have a, seem to have a, a real move away from a war here on the planet and a, a move towards, uh, towards peace. Do you, do you think we can get rid of these nuclear arsenals, and, and how do we go about doing it? Well, you've got to ask what they're for. I mean, presumably, neither the United States nor the Soviet Union really intends to, uh, to blow up the planet uh, you know, destroy the global civilization. That's not what they're about. The uh, professed function of the nuclear weapons on each side is to prevent the other side from using their nuclear weapons. If that's all it is, then we've got to ask, how many nuclear weapons do you need to do that? Massive cuts in the arsenals on both sides. And nothing short of that is going to make us safe. Well, do you, how, do, do you think that... Uh that, that, that there's the political will uh, here in the United States. The Soviets say, tell me, I'm sure they've told you, they're willing to uh, get rid of them, get rid of them uh, on a, over a reasonable uh, time frame because we don't uh, see any confrontations anymore. Do you think that uh, this administration has the political will to, uh, to join in with that? Hard to tell. I mean, it, certainly the new factor, the stunning change in the world situation is the accession of Mikhail Gorbachev to, uh, to power in the Soviet Union. So it's not just that they're willing to have uh, an INF agreement with, uh, with intrusive inspection, American inspectors on Soviet soil, uh, but they're willing to have much more than that. They made, they made unilateral cuts in their um, conventional forces. For a year and a half, they made a unilateral uh, moratorium on nuclear Good weapons testing. testing, inviting the United States to, to respond, to join, to reciprocate. And so far, nothing. Carl, it's been a long time uh, since I've uh, gotten updated or we've been updated on uh, the status of, of the theory of nuclear winter. Could you, could, could you bring us up to date on that? Well, nuclear winter is the predicted, uh, from, from physics calculations, uh, cooling and darkening of the earth following a nuclear war. Basically what happens is uh, mainly from the burning of cities, fine particles get uh, put up into the atmosphere, block sunlight, and uh, so it gets darker and, and cooler. Uh, we uh, did, uh, so uh, for example, 
you could ask how many cities are there on the planet Earth? Let's say a city has 100,000 people or more. You probably don't need more weapons than what's required to destroy every city on Earth. There's only 2,300 cities. So the United States, by that criterion, only needs 2,300 nuclear weapons. Well, we got more than 25,000, more than 10 times enough to destroy every city. Yeah, but not all those cities are our enemies either. No, no, no I mean, we're including we're, our own cities. But the Soviets say they're not our enemies either. I mean, I don't, I don't know right. who, who has enemies so bad that they, they're, they're willing to even think about dropping nuclear weapons on them. That's right. And, and you got to really hate somebody to do that. Well, and it's suicidal. <laughs> I mean, it's stupid even if you hate somebody. If they have nuclear weapons and you attack them, they're going to attack you. And, uh, and so the thing is immensely stupid. If we were only concerned about deterrence, that's the magic word, to deter the other side from using their nuclear weapons, then all you need is a tiny fraction of the present bloated, grotesque, and ruinous, uh, including ruinous in cost, uh, arsenals. Uh, a minimum deterrence that is absolutely safe, that is an invulnerable retaliatory capability, could be done for a thousand nuclear weapons or a few hundred nuclear weapons. So, you see, what's happened recently is there's been this much ballyhooed uh, INF uh, treaty, uh, Intermediate uh, Range Nuclear Forces, which uh, is terrific. I'm all for it. It lowers the arsenals by about 3%, and the nuclear warheads are being recycled. They're not even being gotten rid of. What we have to do is make vast, slowly, our technology increased, improved, but by very slow steps. And just recently, you know, this is what's called an exponential. It's flat for a long time, and then, boom, you suddenly get a huge increase. Increase in population, increase in technology, increase in pollution, increase in our powers to disturb the environment, to change the planetary environment. But we're the same old human beings uh, as, as we were a thousand years ago and a hundred thousand years ago. Um, not much has changed with us. And so it's very hard for us to catch on that, uh, that there's a new situation and we have to adapt to it. On the other hand, that's one thing we humans are good at, uh, adapting, figuring out. Uh, um, we're smart. That's our principal advantage over all the other species. I mean, we're not faster, stronger, better diggers. We don't fly all by ourselves. Uh, what we do is figure out and build because of our, our hands. And so uh, I think there's uh, certainly a chance of getting out of this mess, but not by business as usual, not by the idea that, uh, that we shouldn't plan ahead, not by the idea that anybody can do whatever the hell they want and uh, it doesn't uh, affect the environment. There has to be a new way of looking at the world. A lot of those uh, uh, issues that you, that you raised are global issues. For example, uh, global warming, the greenhouse effect. Uh, you put gases like carbon dioxide or CFCs, other greenhouse gases, into the atmosphere over this country, they don't stay over that country. The, those molecules don't have passports. They don't know about national sovereignty. That's something they never heard of. The atmospheric circulation spreads those gases all over the planet. And so what one country does affects all the other countries. The solution to these kinds